This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to the Alpena City Council meeting of November 7th, 2022. Call the order, please. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Mitchell. Here. Councilmember Nowak. Here. Councilmember Walchak. Here. And Mayor Walgar. Here. Okay. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Noah? Yes. Councilmember Walter? Yes. And Mayor Walbora? Aye. Okay. All right, thank you. I have a proposed modification to the agenda. Um, we have a proclamation to add for World Diabetes Day. Okay. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Noah? Yes. Councilmember Walchuk? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Okay. And Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Carries. Thank you. Uh, approval of the minutes for regular session of October 17th, 2022. Any issue changes? <clears throat> All right. Citizens appearing before council on agenda and non-agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your concerns. If you'd like to do so this evening, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our clerk. And start your presentation. Hello, my name is Michael Kramer. I live at 226 Fair Avenue in Alpena. And I'd like to address a couple of things really quickly. One, I really hope that the city council goes ahead and, and uh, eliminates fluoride from our drinking water. It's a poison and we don't need to add it. We need to remove poisons from our drinking water. And if anybody really believes the propaganda from the dental industry, all they have to do is use fluoride toothpaste. And if they really miss it for their car, they can squirt some in their bucket of water that they wash their car with. But to add it to the city water is to add a contaminant to the water, plus the cost of doing so. It's just ridiculous that we keep doing that when fluoride toothpaste is available. Secondly, I, as you guys know, I fought for dispensaries to be in Alpena. I think it's a great deal. They're really nice facilities are run very well. I'm sort of perplexed as to why uh, curbside delivery is not allowed. And if you're thinking that they're going to distribute uh, marijuana uh, willy nilly around the city to people that shouldn't have it, that's ridiculous. These are well run organizations. Uh, I'm a cancer patient and I use cannabis to prevent the cancer from spreading. And if it get, ever spreads, I would hate to think that you wouldn't let me get my medication because I couldn't get to the store. And if they're willing to make these available to people that are homebound, I think you should let them do it as a sensible extension of your, uh, your smart move to let them come into the city. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm going to pass these out. Oh, great. Thank you for taking the time to let me appear in front of this board on behalf of my mother, Mary Lori, that lives on Richardson Street. Last time I was here, I brought all the books I wrote. I kept saying, this is a great idea. I don't think if you have to buy a hazmat suit to put something into the water, it's the brightest bulb on the tree. I went to the Fluoride Action Network and where the information is freely, I pulled down 76 articles that describe in detail how children will not be as smart as if they didn't drink the water. All of the IQ of children on fluoridated water goes downhill. I pointed out the last meeting was here that I had found lead in my mother's water, actually higher than Flint. That detracts from the IQ. Uh, right now, there is a 29.2% loss of children because of COVID, and the children are yet to be examined to see if there's a loss of IQ there. And I, and I know that everybody wants to have the fluoride in there because they don't want to have tooth decay, but if a man can't go get a job, then he's on welfare, he'll never break this cycle. So there are 76 articles 
Uh, a third of them have come out in the past four years, although they do go back to 1999. And I do realize that you may pay up a vote tonight and you can't look at this, but I had a book made up anyway and published a book just for your uh, knowledge about what you're looking at. I can't see where you'd want to spend $100,000, throw another $6,000 in for a hazmat suit. The county of Montmorency doesn't even have a hazmat suit. And to think that you would buy one because you're going to put something in the water. And I think that would only add to the toxicity of the water on top of the uh, chemicals they put in to kill the zebra mussels. And I don't know if you've looked that over, but that also is a very, very hazardous substance. Okay. That a person should not uh, necessarily want to consume. And when you add the fact that aluminum is purposely added to the drinking water, which is definitely linked to dementia. And I could write you a book on that if you want to see that. I'd like to see that on the drinking water. Before, and I hope before, no, since no, I know, in tonight's uh, Thank you for that. Uh, so I know last year. Thank you, John. Okay. And. Um, if the next person wants to come up, IG is just working on getting the noise in the background noise taken care of. I'm Steve Dean, 2076 Partridge Point. I want to echo the two previous gentlemen's uh, remarks on fluoride. It's a neurotoxin. We don't need it in water. The only thing I read of that's for it would be uh, strengthening kids' teeth and dental. Um, you know, all they got to do is eliminate excess sugar and good oral hygiene and you can take care of that so we don't need to add a neurotoxin to the water thank you thank you thank you angie skiba 635 river i totally disagree we do need to keep fluoride in the water it makes a huge difference i work in the dental field i've been there for many many years and the children that come in that live in the country that have not had their fluoride tested in their water and take tablets or get the help that they need, uh, their amount of cavities are astronomical compared to the children who are getting the fluoride on a daily basis. And adults also get fluoride treatments as well. And it's easy for someone to say you should eat less sugar and you should brush your teeth more, but they don't necessarily do that. And in regards, no disrespect to Dr. Ulrey, uh, but his mother did not do that research. His mother has not appeared once, and I understand she's elderly and it's difficult for her, but he doesn't live here. He's not in Alpena, and I disagree with this presentation the second time from him. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm Brenda Budnick. I live at 7964 Bolton Road, Alpena. I'm a registered dental hygienist and I've been practicing for 36 years. I'm very in favor of continuing to fluoridate Alpena's water system. I urge you as our council members to vote to keep fluoridating our water as it contributes to the overall dental health in our community. Taking fluoride out of our water system completely is like taking away health care. We are a rural community we have very few dentists that take Medicaid low-income patients. Fluoride is kind of like our safety net. It's our, commu our community will be negatively impacted dental health-wise by the lack of fluoridating our water. I feel compelled to comment on the safety of fluoridating our water today. The science regarding the dental health benefits and the safety of fluoride is well documented and has been for years. I want to personally thank those that work to make our water safe to drink. You are trained to safely use all the ingredients necessary. I am aware that you would also be trained to safely use the liquid form of fluoride should that come to fruition. Similar to every single person in this room safely using their toilet bowl cleaner at home, you would safely make our water drinkable. Simply stated, fluoride is safe if it is used in the right proportions. Let's continue to improve the health of our community by strengthening teeth to protect them from decay. Let's provide fluoridated water to both our young and our old. You wouldn't take away their health care. You shouldn't take away the vitamin that helps their dental care. Fluoride helps all. Thank you.
Pam Agos, 619 Aquaview, Alpena. I speak in favor of continuing to add fluoride to our community water supply. I'm a registered dental hygienist of 29 years, and I grew up in a dental family. There are a few things that I think we need the public to be aware of. We are one of 13 counties that has not upgraded to the liquid fluoride delivery system. There are state funds and grants that can be applied for to offset the cost to the city. Many municipalities are already using this in the state as well as in the country, and they're doing it safely. I'm a local, or I'm sorry, there's no argument that fluoride benefits the teeth. Um, I think my biggest question would be, over all my years in practice, I have never heard of anyone who's been medically diagnosed with any compromised situation or condition that is directly linked to fluoride in the municipal water. Not a friend, not a patient, not a family member, not through any of my colleagues that I've spoken to at the state or the local level. Have you? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Noni Muller. I live at 20, 226 Fair Avenue, Alpena. And um, I just have a couple of comments. One is we are all subjecting ourselves to a dental medical treatment without consent. And that's a big part of any medical treatment. Um, if you look on the internet, it doesn't take long, look up the benefits of fluoride and then look up the uh, side effects or the damaging effects. And you're gonna see pictures of people with teeth that and gum problems. I myself had fluoride treatments because my mom thought this is great, we want strong teeth. I've had almost every tooth in my mouth capped or implants because they're brittle, they break and they're yellow. <laughs> I work very hard to find toothpaste that doesn't have fluoride in it. Um, on any tube of toothpaste that says, you know, it has fluoride, it says if a child or anybody swallows the toothpaste or a kid might get in the bathroom and eat it because it tastes good, they are to go to the emergency room immediately. Now that doesn't happen when you're eating something else. Fluoride is, I don't think of it as a vitamin, but more as a toxic chemical. It's a byproduct of industrial waste. And I think that it's really a shame that the sugar industry is the one that said, sugar doesn't make you, give you dental cavities. It's, you know, you need the fluoride. So sugar is a big problem. It ruins the metabolism and the health of the child. And we have sick kids with sick teeth and sick gums we ought to look at the larger picture. Thank you. Marsha Butler, I live at 308 South 8th Avenue. Um, I lived in a community where we had this fluoride issue as on, on the referendum. And so the result was that we got a lot of good research on both sides of the fence. And um, one thing that came up is that uh, fluoride is, is good for your teeth for, for children up to the age of 10. After the age of 10, fluoride has no effect on your teeth. Um, secondly, um, fluoride's been linked to other problems that many have brought up and um, also osteoporosis. It inhibits the body's ability for you to uh, process calcium properly. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, um, so those are a couple of the things on, on either side of the fence that happened. What this community decided to do um, to meet everybody's needs was they took the money um, that would go into fluoridating the water and 
um, they made fluoride treatments that come out of a tube, like when you go to the, I used to go to the dentist and we had this thing that you put a fluoride treatment. They made that available, the county made that available for free for people, for, for children 10 and under or 12 and under um, so that uh, everybody's needs were met. I think that, uh, I think everyone in this room probably knows that why fluoride, right? That's a question, why not vitamin C or you know something that we all need? Um, and uh, as some of you have already noted, uh, it was an offshoot of the aluminum industry trying to get rid of their tailings. So um, I think uh, those are just a few things. I personally hope that we decide not to use this kind of heavy metal. It's not, it's not a vitamin. It's, it's a heavy metal and we're ingesting it, as someone pointed out again, involuntarily. So those are a couple of um, things that maybe we could all think about. Thank you. Um, excuse me, Ms. Butler. Yeah. Can you um, can you tell me what that community was? Yeah, it's Tompkins County in New York State, Tompkins. and Tompkins, T O M P K I N S, and they had done it. I, I think they took fluoride out of their water for at least a decade or two, and then it came up again on the referendum. So they may actually have dental data, um, you know, longer term dental data, so that you could see you know, how, how it actually does affect the teeth. But again, kids could go to the county. I think it was a once a week treatment or something for the kids, uh, 10 and under. But for adults, it has absolutely, there's absolutely no benefit for adult teeth. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tiffany Bloomer. I live at 210 North 11th Avenue, and I'm here to talk about the curbside for neighborhood provisions. Um, I want to explain that um, I was recently diagnosed with POTS, postural uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. I have a max of three minutes to stand up here before my heart gets to about 158 beats per minute, which means curbside was the best option for me. I can't stand in there. I can't walk in there. And if it's really bad, if it's really busy, I'm not getting my medicine. And I also have a 12 year old daughter who has been in cannabis since she was five with uh, severe autism, self injurious behaviors. And it has been it's life changing for her because I'm against pharmaceuticals because she's partially nonverbal, can't tell me what it does to her. So um, yeah, I, we, we need curbside back because I'm not able to uh, go inside and wait in line with everyone else. So if you could just consider that it's not just, you know, recreational cannabis, it's also medical. And there's also people who met 151. That's why. <laughs> Thank you, though. Thank you. Okay, anyone else live in the room want to come up? Hi, my name's Linda Courier. I live on um, 8408. Greenwood Street. Um, we're a local family and we moved here in 1981 and we raised our children here and have been giving back to the community since then. Ever since opening, we have done everything you've asked and more for neighborhood provisions. I feel that we are not supported by the officials that run the city that we love. I've had two back surgery, which has caused me to be disabled in the past. During these times, I was not able to get out of my car. If cannabis were my medication and dispensaries were available, you would be making it physically impossible for me to receive my health care. It's hard not to feel that these rules and ordinance, ordinance are being selectively enforced when there are places around town that you can literally pick up narcotics, alcohol, and cigarettes curbside. They will walk these products right out to your car. So just as we were asking you to allow us to do, what makes this process different than ours? Please help us understand so we can offer curbside to our customers just as they, they all do. Thank you. Laura Courier at 328 West Washington. 
Um, I work at Neighborhood Provisions and have seen firsthand the desperate need for curbside in this city. While yes, some do use it as a luxury, others need it as a way of life. We have customers who are wheelchair bound or amputees, others who suffer with daily and chronic pain, and some who simply appreciate the choice of having discretion in this small town. When we opened, we were blessed with the opportunity to offer this service to people, allowing some to get comfortable using it. Taking curbside away was devastating for these customers as they genuinely needed it to receive their medication or relief from pain. Working the front desk, I now saw these people struggling to get into our building, and it feels so wrong and unjustifiable to have to tell them that we're not allowed to simply walk the product out to their car, as so many other businesses do in Alpena already. The hospital is allowed to offer curbside to their patients, walking out heavy narcotics and other controlled substances they need. Why are we not allowed to do the same? While I do understand and respect the fact that some may not see cannabis as medication, I get it. There are still businesses in Alpena that offer curbside for other adult use substances, such as alcohol and cigarettes. They're allowed to bring these items right to your car, and it seems as though they're either not following the same rules as we are, being reprimanded as we are, or the same rules just simply do not apply to them. And it's hard to understand your decisions when it seems like we all want the same things here. To work together as a community and to build Alpena up, that's what makes this place so special. So when you deny curbside, you are effectively denying members of your community a choice and the ability to receive things that genuinely improve their overall quality of life. We know there is an actual need for curbside here in our community. We are asking you to work with us on this issue uh, so we can continue to provide top-notch services for everyone regardless of their personal circumstances. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Courier, 240 South State Avenue, Alpena. I am one of the owners of Neighborhood Provisions, Alpena's first and finest provisioning center at 909 West Washington. I'm here today uh, to discuss the recent changes to the marijuana ordinance, if you have heard several times before, uh, a decision that has hindered our business operations, hurt our patients and customers, and ultimately impairs the progress of this community. Now, on August 29th, we received a letter to, from the city to cease and desist curbside a service many of our patients have come to rely on. Now, curbside was something uh, we did not push for at the very beginning. Uh, on the contrary, it was the customers, the patients, who started calling and requesting this service. And as a medical marijuana dispensary, we meet the patient where their needs are. Uh, now, if you back the timeline up to May 24th, 2021, uh, the governor announced emergency COVID rules that eventually allowed curbside for cannabis dispensaries uh, that protected the safety, wellness, and access to Michigan residents. Uh, on March 29th, Neighborhood Provisions and Alpena had its first medical cannabis sales. On April 19th, we had our first adult use sales. On April 26th, we had our first official curbside sale by someone who was physically unable, an amputee, to get out of their car. Uh, from then on, we saw a steady increase in curbside orders, the reasons for needing and eventually requiring curbside for some patients and guests amounted, ultimately ending when the city sent the cease and desist letter. Now, many of these reasons we hadn't considered until the need was in front of us, needs that were not apparent to us and may not be apparent if you're not interacting with these needs every day. So please allow me to lay out these needs that we have seen for you. Uh, one of the largest groups that has been affected by this are parents. Uh, per state law, anyone under the age of 21 without a medical license cannot enter the dispensary. So any parent with kids cannot enter. For some people, this is quite impossible to run errands without their kids. Very often, the only time they have in between school, work, and home is with their kids or they are simply forced to not get the medicine or put themselves in unsafe situations with untested, unregulated medicine. Uh, another issue is physical limitations. Many of our guests have physical handicaps where walking, opening doors, standing, sitting is painful, cumbersome, and outright embarrassing sometimes to be in that situation, all for something they had previously been able to sit in their car for. Another one is immune compromised. We serve many cancer patients, many with weakened and fragile immune systems, people who are at risk 
in being in crowded areas. Another one we have seen, and uh, this one was surprising how often this occurs, is debilitating anxiety. Patients with general and social anxiety and agoraphobia, the fear of crowds, and we have more of those crowds in our dispensary as curbside was a way for us to streamline our operations. So now we have a backup in our dispensary. Uh, many of these people have to go through the gauntlet of their fears of social anxieties just to get their medication. Anonymity is a large one. Uh, as legal cannabis is something that is still in its infancy, something that we're still dealing with the social and cultural implications for, which is completely understandable, which is why we're here today understanding all of this. Uh, there are personal, very personal reasons why there is discretion needed for something like this, whether it's their job, their family, their professional image prevents them from being seen. And we as a business and as a municipality need to respect that decision. Safety is another one for some guests. They simply feel safer in their car having us walk it out to them as opposed to them coming inside for it. Again, it is a personal preference that should be allowed to them. Now, for several months, we have offered for a very slow response rate delivery as an option. Uh, however, with delivery, there was also unseen circumstances that arose that we didn't know about until we put it into action. Anonymity was one of them for similar reasons for curbside. Uh, many people don't want their neighbors, their relatives, their friends, their roommates, landlords, seeing that they have any association with it. Others might simply not want us as a business seeing where they live. Another reason is per state law, we must deliver to a verified residential address and no PO boxes, no businesses, no short-term rentals, so no travelers or tourists, which really hurt us as a tourist and industrial town. Uh, this keeps people who are even driving through US 23 and stopping, they would not get out with us. They may simply drive to the township, which will allow curbside when their first dispensary finally opens. Uh, we even have a 50 mile delivery radius that we are trying to get access to as many people as possible, but still delivery does not solve some of the issues that curbside simply resolved. Technology limitations is another one for delivery. Uh, we live in a large retirement community and technology skills needed to order online can be very cumbersome. We are one of the few dispensaries in Michigan that take phone orders on or phone orders over the phone. Uh, this is because it is cumbersome, it is time consuming for both the uh, workers we have and for the people on the phone. We've got an additional 30 seconds. Thank you, sir. So, uh, in conclusion, um, we politely and respectfully feel that the language in the ordinance does not specify curbside is not allowable. The ordinance does not state curbside at all. It simply states drive through, which we are not asking for. We are here today to ask you to reinstate curbside as the ordinance is written. Us, along with over 500 signed, uh, signed people of this community, want this. I also have several uh, other communities that have allowed curbside in this state, and I will pass it out to you. Uh, so please, people are calling us, asking for our help every day. We are doing everything we can to help. Now we are asking you for your help. Please help us. Thank you for your time. Uh, anyone else that's here? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Bob Courier. I've been a practicing physician in this town for over 40 years. Uh, my family's been here for equally that time as well. What has happened here with our business and everything else in the curbside, the people that are hurt the most are the people that need it the most. The people that are immunocompromised, veterans. We had a couple of people that were gonna come here tonight to show you why they need curbside. They couldn't make it and they would have had trouble getting up here to show you. Uh, we're getting calls in my practice now, my regular practice, my ophthalmology practice about people that cannot receive what they need and have had difficulty getting it. 
What also Kevin did not tell you is that the state of Michigan does not allow us to consume on that property. These other properties and businesses that we're talking that do allow curbside are allowed to consume on the property. We by state law cannot. I understand when this ordinance was first put up, it was simply because I guess they were worried about consumption and then the detritus or debris that would be left behind because of some consumption on the property. And again, I may be misinterpreting that, but again, that's what I understand. Well, that's not applicable to us because we cannot consume on the property at all, again, by state law. Again, I'd like you to consider simply for all our patients, all the people, the veterans, the immunocompromised, the people that are afraid to even show they need curbside. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Hello, my name is Daniel Ludwig. I live at 135 North Ripley Boulevard. I'm here just to say that uh, I believe all life on this planet matters a great deal, especially our wildlife. And I'm very opposed to the slaughter of our geese and swans that has been taking place. I have been noticing the gunshots uh, two Sunday mornings early, one Saturday afternoon, or sun Saturday morning, I estimate there were probably 50 to 70 gunshots going off around the city. That sounded like at Mr. Q is in the Washington Park area. And I think the slaughter is just uh, uncalled for, brutal, senseless. I love wildlife. I enjoy seeing the geese and the swans. I don't see any real reason for it. The only thing I've heard is that uh, supposedly there are too many of them. Well, I don't think they cause any harm, first of all. They're beautiful to see. And I just think it's a sense of slaughter and I'm very opposed to it and I wish the city would reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Last call for in the house. Anyone virtual, Charlie? Yes. Okay. You could turn that on. Brenda? Hello. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for allowing public comment on the fluoride issue tonight. My name is Brenda Stedemeyer. I work in the Wisconsin water industry. I'm a mom and I have a degree in environmental engineering with a focus on water and wastewater. I've also majored in cellular molecular biology at University of Wisconsin Green Bay because I am especially interested in how water and contaminants in water affect human health and the environment. My children and I are plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit against the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency because fluoride in water is just as toxic as lead. Fluoride causes permanent brain damage at low levels just like lead. The reason I am here today is because the Michigan Fluoride Program Coordinator Sandy Sutton showed up at my local Wisconsin community meetings through Zoom and misled my council. Sandy told my council that fluoride is an essential mineral necessary for dental health. This is false. Fluorosilicic acid used by water utilities is not a mineral. It is a contaminated chemical waste scrubbed from fertilizer factory chimneys. For example, the fluoride chemical used in Wisconsin contains lead and arsenic, which are both known toxins that the U.S. spends billions of dollars to remove from our water. Do you know that fluoride in drinking water has never, ever had a randomized control trial finding it reduces tooth decay when added to water? Fluoride promoters will tell you that fluoride's effectiveness has been well established and is safe, not knowing that there has never been a randomized control trial to support this statement. What they will use to support this statement is that the government agencies, associations, and dental bodies endorse fluoride. 
Endorsement is not science. Do not be fooled by unsubstantiated endorsements being promoted as science. When I was studying cellular molecular biology, we were taught to always look at the primary peer-reviewed science Never trust secondary sources such as governmental agencies because politics can distort the science and positions of these groups. Sandy Sutton also brought to my attention that there are Michigan communities drinking fluoride at levels of 1.5 milligrams per liter. The U.S. National Toxicology Program concluded in their two draft monographs released in 2019 and 2020, quote, Fluoride is a presumed neurotoxicant hazardous to human health, end quote. The level they cited as the level of neurotoxic concern is 1.5. Sandy told my counsel that she did not believe this level has impacted the brains in the community. I argue that the dental hygienist with a job title to promote and protect fluoride programs has probably not looked for any indication of permanent brain harm in these kids. I do not believe she is qualified to assess these kids for learning disabilities, ADHD, and behavioral problems. In my lawsuit, there was a benchmark dose analysis submitted by Philippe Grandjean from Harvard Public School of Health and others. What they found is that when a pregnant mother exposes her fetus to fluoride levels as low as 0.2, we can expect a drop in IQ by one point. One IQ point is what EPA has used for establishing lead standards in the U.S. We are fighting for EPA to do their job and properly assess fluoride in the same way. If you conduct a benchmark dose analysis using the dozen high quality studies listed in the National Toxicology Program monograph, finding fluoride harms the brain at levels at or below 0.7, you will find 0.3 is the level that we, we begin to see IQ being reduced by one IQ point. 0.2 and 0.3 are very tiny amounts compared to the 0.7 that is promoted as optimal for our water. I'm really sick and tired of dentists who do not accept Medicaid and Medicare patients into their practice stating how important fluoride is in drinking water for poor people. Poor kids need dentists like them to take them in as patients. For over 77 years, we have been misled to think fluoride has been established as safe and effective by dental interest, while they failed to randomize a study to support their claims. They basically have done unblinded, unblinded studies to support their unproven hypothesis. This is junk science to support junk fluoride chemicals contaminated with lead and arsenic. Our case is back in federal court in January. If you want more information, I have a website, fluoridelawsuit.com. I have a science page on that website that contains over 100 primary research studies that have been peer reviewed and published since 2015 through today. Finding fluoride harms the brain, thyroid, bones, heart, and kidneys. After our lawsuit is concluded, we can release our depositions from the CDC and EPA and others where you will be able to hear how the fluoride program has misled many smart people over 77 years. Fluoride is an outdated program that needs to be discontinued like DDT. Brenda, led this. Thank you. Got Brenda, you have an yes. additional 30 seconds, please. I'm done. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. <laughs> Charlie, do you have anybody else on there? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for, um, for your input for meeting. You got more? We got more? Online. Oh, someone else online? Okay. Sandy, go ahead, Sandy. Thank you. Um, I did want to briefly address that. I do agree with Brenda on one point, um, especially with uh, dentists accepting Medicaid and Medicare uh, patients. Uh, that is something that is not being addressed well enough. And of course, we would love to see that done. Um, there are many things that are added to our water. Um, 
we had things to balance our pH, uh, sulfide, uh, chloride, orophosphates, uh, alum, polymers. All of these things are meant to make our water healthy. Yes, you might be amazed to learn all of the things that our water operators do, but they are well trained. They are licensed. They wear their proper PPE for everything that is added. So not everything is all you know just general water pulled from the lakes and brought into you. There are things that need to be made it to done to it to make it healthy. These additives are done for our health. These go through the Safe Water Act. Education of people, you know, these are one of the things heavily being questioned um, along with this uh, lawsuit, which has been going on for many years. They have failed in many different occasions and we just accept that. There's constantly going to be questions done to everything that we do with our water, everything we do with our communities, and it's good for things to be questioned. However, there have been thousands of research uh, uh, presentations done on fluoridation itself. Fluoride is a natural element. Many of our systems in here in Michigan have this naturally. It is naturally occurring. Um, as Brenda mentioned, I did talk about uh, for Wisconsin, some of the natural levels that we do have in Michigan. We do have a ceiling level of a secondary level of 2.0 parts per million to where if it's above that, then you're cautioned not to drink it. So drinking water that is naturally occurring at a 1.5 is still below that ceiling. Systems that do add fluoride, bringing it to that level of 0.7, below one point per million, one part per million, brings a health level to our people, to our children, to our teenagers, to our adults, to our seniors. You can continue to utilize fluoride at every age through all of our life cycles. This is not something that stops just because you're eight or 10 years old. However, you cannot get fluorosis once you are over that age. That is you know, one of the areas where uh, someone was uh, mistaken. It is for our health and to remove fluoride from the water is basically taking away one of your health benefits. The city can look at it as we are taking this out to save our city money. It is going to cost your city money in the end. You will see much more poor health because your mouth is still attached to the rest of your body. Anything happening in your mouth has a distinct effect on the rest of your body. This will connect to your heart, to your lungs, to your kidneys, to every other part. And for everything that Ms. Brenda keeps you know, bringing about, still it has been disproven left and right. And no matter what the various organizations say, fluoride causes, that specific organization you know, says, no, it doesn't. When you look at cancer, when you look at bones, when you look at kidneys, when you look at all other parts that are, you know, they state is, you know, brings about, you know, bad things from having fluoride, that main organization says, no, it doesn't. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Can I still say something? Maybe. You can come up, Norm, sure. <laughs> I'm Norm Poley, a 1160 Trowbridge Drive in Charter Township of Alpena. I think you've heard a lot of facts tonight about fluoride for and against. I just uh, hope that this council, when they decide to make their decision one way or the other, that they keep the citizens of the city of Alpena and the Charter Township of Alpena in their mind and make the correct decision. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> 
All right, again, I appreciate everyone's input. Um, it's valuable, um, more than you probably know. So we'll move on with the rest of our meeting. Um, no official public hearing this evening. So next up is the consent agenda. A is bills to be allowed in the amount of $231,408.72. I think, is that correct, Anna? There's a comma in there. Okay. Um, B is uh, approval to enter into an agreement with financial recovery strategies for exclusive claims management in the caustic soda class action suit and authorize the clerk to sign on behalf of the city. C is a recognition of the Ella White Parent Advisory Committee as a nonprofit organization operating in the community for the purpose of obtaining a charitable gaming license. D is a Michigan Department of Transportation uh, contract number 225454 be approved to Mayor Walagora and City Clerk Treasurer Finance Director so I be authorized to sign the contract on behalf of the city. E is a budget amendment request to reduce American Rescue Plan Act fund balance in the amount of $45,865 for the purchase of body uh, police body cameras. F is a budget amendment request to reduce ARPA fund balance in the amount of $20,000 for the fire kitchen renovations. And G is the budget amendment request to reduce ARPA fund balance in the amount of $10,000 for the skate park project. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Council Member Nowak? Yes. Council Member Walchuk? Yes. Mayor Walgora? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. And Council Member Mitchell? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, announcements this evening. Uh, first is the general election will be held tomorrow, November 8th, 2022. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. New voters may register to vote at the clerk's office with proof of residency until 8 p.m. on election day. B is the City of Alpena Police Department would like to remind city residents that vehicles cannot be parked on the city streets between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. from November 1st through April 1st. Violators will be cited and vehicles may be towed at the owner's expense. And we're up to a proclamation I have. Uh, this is for World Diabetes Day. Whereas the American Diabetes Association was founded in 1940 to prevent and cure diabetes and improve the lives of all people affected by diabetes, and whereas in the United States in 2019, 37.3 million people, including over 912,794 people in Michigan, have diabetes, a serious disease with potential life-threatening complications such as heart disease, stroke, blindness, kidney disease, and amputation. And whereas an additional 86 million people in the United States are at risk for developing type 2 diabetes, and recent estimates project that as many as one in three children born today will have diabetes by the time they are 50 years old if current trends continue. And whereas the ADA has been funding innovative research since 1955 and has committed more than $37 million to research projects at leading research institutions throughout the country, and whereas the ADA fights on behalf of the diabetes community to increase federal funding for diabetes research and programs, to improve comprehensive health care and insurance coverage, and to end discrimination against people with diabetes. And whereas, an increase in community awareness is necessary to put a stop to diabetes. Now, there I, uh, now therefore, I, Matthew J. Walagora, Mayor of the City of Alpena, do hereby proclaim the day of November 14, 2022, as World Diabetes Day, and I uh, also hereby proclaim the month of November 2022 as American Diabetes Month in the city of Alpena. I encourage all citizens to recognize American Diabetes Month and join the American Diabetes Association Stop Diabetes Movement to confront, fight, and most importantly, change the future of this deadly disease. And I believe we have a guest with us today from the ADA. Tammy Rumanaf, and this is um, Becky Wade, and we're from my Michigan Health and Alpena at the hospital. We work at the Women's Care Clinic. 
Um, I am the program director and Becky is a clinical nurse manager and we're here today to um, just bring awareness for World Diabetes Day and um, American Diabetes Month um, and, and just remind you to look, at, look after those who may have diabetes and we do have a diabetes awareness fair on Monday at the hospital. You'll see flyers around. Um, so if you want to learn more, come and see. And You're welcome you. to come and join us in the auditorium at my Michigan Medical Center, Alpena, on the 14th. Wonderful. Thank you. Take an ice cream. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I do the jokes on this guy. <laughs> Okay, when you're ready, next we have report of officers, uh, a second reading of ordinance 22-481, which amends the city of Alpena zoning map, and Bill has that. Uh, consistent with council policy, this would not be read a second time unless one of the members uh, re requires it or requests it. This is uh, the rezoning from CCD to B2 of the property formerly known as Lez Restaurant, and it's primarily to allow drive through service. I have no questions, Mr. No Ray. questions. Anyone? Questions. Uh, issues? Bill, one more time. They, they, it, there was drive-through service there before. There was. I was don't know how long ago. Bud's Burgers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Restaurant. Okay. So I move we adopt ordinance number 22-481. Second. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. Thank you. Uh, next is the Northeast Michigan Materials Management Authority, and Rachel is here to present that. Good evening, everyone. All right. Uh, so the Alpena Resource Recovery Program has partnered for many years with Northeast Michigan Council of Governments to operate the Alpena Resource Recovery Facility located on M32, along with a network of net, or excuse me, a network of collection sites. The program provides recycling and materials management services to residents and businesses throughout Alpena County. The program also provides annual community collection events, uh, which includes a countywide cleanup day and an electronics recycling event. And it's largely funded through an interlocal agree agreement authorizing the collection of an annual surcharge of $20 per household. So the current facility has reached capacity and has actually been at or <laughs> under capacity, I guess. Um, so it, it's just woefully um, undersized for our needs here in Alpena County. The Resource Recovery Board has been working diligently over the past few years to develop a regional recycling facility and um, that will meet the growing needs of Alpena County and to serve the unmet needs of the surrounding counties. This new material recovery facility or MRF is ante anticipated to cost 5.8 million of which approximately 70 2% of the funding has been secured through various grants, and I listed them out, State of Michigan, um, and some appropriations. Alpena County has also made a commitment through their ARPA funding in the amount of $500,000 and a long-term lease for property out at the airport or adjacent to the um, Alpena County Airport. It's anticipated that the new MRF could be constructed by fall, and I say could be, it will be constructed by 2024. The facility would be able to accommodate additional capacity and new materials that are not currently accepted and would serve as a regional hub for recycling materials man management for Northeast Michigan. The new MRF also creates the opportunity for a circular economy so we can recycle uh, materials locally that also go to locally based um, uh, companies such as Great Lakes Tissue and Sheboygan and another example could be um, we're working on glass recycling um, that would go directly over to Lafarge here in Alpena. The board is looking into the future for this um, gov as with a governing structure as well so that it's inclusive of all the entities. At a recent intergovernmental committee meeting on October 6th, the Articles of Incorporation for this new authority 
which is the Northeast Michigan Materials Management Authority, were introduced and discussed. And um, lots of great discussion there, and uh, there was a, a lot of interest. And so I did list out the um, basically the act there, number 230. 233 of 1955 that allows us to establish an authority. So with that, um, Alpena County and the Charter Township of Alpena have already adopted these articles and we anticipate that a number of uh, the townships within the county will follow suit. So it's my recommendation as city manager that the Alpena City Council adopt resolution number 2022-17 that is attached and I provided a sample motion for you. Has anybody got any questions? It was covered extensively at the IG meeting, so I'm kind of a, and there was some few changes made uh, mm -hmm. since then that I appreciated. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any other questions for Rachel or? No questions. Don't mind if I read it. I'm practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Be our guest. <laughs> um, I don't understand. Oh, you don't have to read the resolution, luckily. So I move I mm -hmm. that we approve. <clears throat> Support. Oh. I could. Okay. I just didn't have the words there, but here I go. I move to adapt resolution. Number 2022-17, authorizing the city of Alpena to adopt the Articles of Incorporation of the Northeast Michigan Materials Management Authority. Second. Do we do a second? I said it second the first time she did it. Did you already second? I'd like to do third. Okay. I, I got Danny her short version. Go you... Danny apparently. <laughs> okay. okay. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Proton Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Councilmember Black? Yes. Councilmember Walchuk? Yes. Thank you so much. All right, next up is uh, unfinished business, and this is the water production plant fluoridization update, and Steve Schultz, city engineer, is here. Go ahead, I'm listening. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so in 2021, the city started to experience uh, supply shortages and shipping issues related to the powdered fluoride product used in the water production process. Throughout the last year, staff has provided various options on how to handle this issue going into the future. I offer the following review and update to re and request council's direction moving forward. In June of this year, we purchased 2,200 pounds of sodium silica fluoride, which is our standard and preferred type since it is a higher concentration and less product <clears throat> is required to achieve the suggested levels. The supply for less than half the year cost $6,700, which is roughly what we used to spend for an entire year. Here's a review of our current options. Option one, we can continue to order the powdered, powdered product when available, but supply is questionable. The price continues to rise and no supplier will guarantee a price for longer than three months. The fluoride purchased in May was $3.05 per pound. Our current vendor has indicated that they can provide our preferred powdered product, but the price has increased to $3.45 a pound, which translates to $7,600 for that same amount purchased earlier this year. Um, I have a suggested motion under each option, if, depending on what council would like to go with. Um, option two is to convert to a liquid product. Liquid is the most popular method of adding fluoride and is the most available as it is manufactured in the US. This method of adding fluoride can be a more toxic environment but is safe if it's done correctly. Um, there are additional safety precautions associated, which are more expensive than the powdered. Um, that should be noted, I guess. Uh, there is currently $100,000 budgeted for this year's, uh, in this year's budget for these renovations, if that is the direction that council wishes to proceed. <clears throat> the yearly cost of liquid fluoride additive is approximately $20,000. That's this year's prices, kind of what we estimated. Um, option three would be to cease the addition of fluoride to the water altogether. Uh, since EGLE does not require the addition of fluoride, they also do not regulate the process by which a municipality starts or stops the process. They do, however, recommend that a public input session is held, which we did on November 20 or December 20th of last year uh, 
We had a session entitled Possible Elimination of Fluoride in the Drinking Water Production Process. Uh, many people made comments then, and many people have made comments throughout different city council meetings at the, in that um, initial uh, um, public comment period, um, and especially tonight as well. So I, I think we've we've satisfied that portion of it, re, you know, receiving public comment. So um, a search of city records does not seem to indicate that any council action or vote of the people to start the fluoridation process in 1958. The one requirement that Eagle has in halting the process is that we set a date to stop adding fluoride and inform the public of that date as soon as practical. And there's a suggested motion there as well. So we estimate right now 40, 40 days or so left. I think I have 50. 50. Okay. So we set, I just, I put a date in there of December 1st if we wanted to use that motion because that, you know, I can guarantee that we have enough until then at least. That's what you have right now? Yeah. Correct. And more is available right now? Right now, yeah. Yep. How long did the last order that you made last? When was that, did you say in here? I'm sorry. Um, it was ordered in May. Uh, we got it in June. Um, and this is, that's the batch that's lasting through November, I believe. Yeah. So roughly five to six months. We ordered what, 2,200? 20, 2,200, right. Six and 7,000 pounds a year okay. of that product. Yeah. Sodium silicate fluoride isn't available. We've got sodium fluoride for a while. Mm -hmm. For a year, we've estimated maybe about 10,000 pounds because there's less fluoride content. Okay. 11,000 pounds. Right. So the cost goes up significantly with that. Problem. Yeah. Looking at right now at today's prices, we're looking at our, our preferred product would be about 23,500 up from the 7,000 that we've been spending, you know, yearly uh, on average. Um, and then the other uh, powdered uh, product that we use that we are, isn't as high a concentration, we're looking at it's about thirty-eight thousand dollars annually to do what we need. You wanted to cut your borage out of that product? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's a discussion just between us. If I if I start allowing that, it becomes a huge debate. I'm sorry. Um, Anybody else got questions for Steve? No, no, no questions on that. I don't, um, as I'm maybe indicating by my questions. Um, just not particularly excited about making a decision tonight. Um, I don't know where the rest of council is. Uh, I just, it, it's just, Absolutely overwhelming, to be honest with you. Probably the biggest decision we've ever, the most complicated decision that I've made in my 11 years. Um, and so, um, yeah. So I just kind of keep on limping along and reading and talking to people um, almost daily. Uh, so, so I don't know. I'm not. I'm not ready. Are you uh, just not ready? Ms. Mayor, are you asking for the motion to be postponed? <laughs> um, I'm not going to say table, I promise. She doesn't. And if you can indicate a date. Um, so, so, well, let me ask council this. I mean, is, is everybody else done with their research? Everybody else is ready no. to no. make a decision? No, I don't think. Okay. I, know that, I know that I'm not because there's been new information that has come out that I'm just recently become aware of that I'd like to do a little bit further research myself. Um, you know, I, I think that we've had some good information. We've had some other information come out and I think that uh, time to <laughs> digest it, time to, you know, kind of go through. So right now I think, you know, it isn't easy either to, I mean, because it, it's going to take a while. I don't know if I could be ready within, you know, a couple of weeks at the next meeting even, you know. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, if that's the deadline that the rest of the council is comfortable with, I can put a lot more time in. But, you know, I'm thinking maybe. I have a procedural question. What happens when there are three different options before council? We just, we are holding off 
we can any kind of decision for whatever but i but how does it work when you have three different options sure so we have so we have three options obviously um so let's just say for instance somebody at this table they were ready for option three i'm ready for option three right now i'm just saying theoretically right, gotcha. um <clears throat> then i would propose that i would basically just read that that suggested motion and then and then we would have probably some more dialogue because I was probably blindsided at least three people in the room. Um, and so we would have some dialogue and then we and then we would vote when somebody makes a motion and somebody else gives it support. There's a vote. So let's say theoretically, I'm the only one that wants option three. And so somebody will support me just so we can vote and get it off the table. Um, I like it. It's cleaner that way. Um, you can support something just so we can vote. and and move it off the table because if I make a motion and nobody supports it, it, it does kind of die. Um, it can, a motion can die if nobody wants to support it, then you kind of know right off that we might as well not vote because I'm the only one that made the motion and nobody wants to support it. So that's that's how that works. Um, I, I, can't, I, I made it clear that I, I'm not necessarily ready. Uh, we've done that before. Um, it's generally me or Michael um, in different topics throughout. It, it's common and it's fine. I, I want to let you guys know that if I have to vote right now, I'm not comfortable. So I'm probably going to vote no on any option right now just because I'm not comfortable. So and we don't have to make a decision tonight. Um, uh, if there's at least two of us and perhaps even more that aren't necessarily ready, um, We've pushed this before. This has come up at several meetings now, and so we kind of push it out. And that's why I keep asking um, Stephen and Mike where we're at as far as the product goes. Um, for me, it's not necessarily a funding thing. It's, I'm not. I'm trying not to use the amount of money that we're using as a resource because we've literally been doing it for since 1958. So another $7,000 worth of product if we weren't talking about this, we would be spending that anyhow. So I'm really not trying, I'm, I'm trying to just, just kind of put the amount of money that we're spending over here because we, because we would have been spending it anyhow. We've already spent and, that money. So could we, could we motion then to say, let's have a decision by the time that stuff runs out? Um, is, does it work that way or is it not necessary? Well, because you'd have to, you'd have to define runs out. Or, okay. And, and I don't want to, because there's currently, I mean, I know it's currently, there's probably more that we could get. I, I don't wanna, we put a deadline on something like that. And then now, now what if there are like eight different things that came up or resources that we didn't have? Um, you know, for instance, um, uh, Miss Sandy that spoke today and, and um, uh, a, couple, a couple of the gals there, um, Brenda, Linda. and we have a new book um i don't know enough i don't know enough about the liquid form um i know a whole lot about the public the powdered form that i didn't necessarily want to know um now i do <laughs> and so i, I want to know more about that and so for me it's okay who are the communities that are using it how long have they been using it we know one that started using it had to discontinue and isolate that uh, that entire portion of their plant because of some issue they had I don't want those issues, but I only heard that from somebody, so I haven't talked to that, or I don't even know if staff has directly spoken to them. I think we read it somewhere. Um, so th there's all this stuff, and if I don't have it all, I'm not. I'm just not ready. Um, whether that's going to be, I'm looking at a calendar. Um, whether that's going to be on the by the 21st, fifth. I would assume. I w I would assume. We would, um, so if we can postpone it until the fifth, uh, if that if staff thinks that's something that we can do logically, um, and I know you're put in a position now, so okay, well now we're going to go to the fifth, and if it, if if we go with uh, option one, then um, then you'll have you'll have to get on it like. Well, and that's the thing is option one is basically a continuation right. of what we're doing. If if I don't get any direction tonight, I'm going to proceed on what I'm doing and I'm going to I'm going to buy it at, you know, whatever rate I can find 
and whichever product I can get in that powdered form, I'm just going to buy it because that's what we're doing. That's that's your direction. If we that's yeah yeah. Um, so how much do you have to buy at one time? Is there? They like us to buy a, a pallet which is 2,200 pounds. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking. So at, at that you know at seven seven to eight thousand dollars a a pallet basically. Yep. Well, and even if you make a decision you could still use up the fluoride mm -hmm. and then discontinue right. at whatever date you see fit. Yeah, well, that's, if that's the difference. That, that, yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, another six months of something we've been doing since 1958 is, isn't. Mm -hmm. and, and that was kind of my question as well. Do, do, because of what Steve has to take care of, do we have to make it this? So even though we have three options, it, it could be procedurally that we could vote on each option and and say yes or no but we want and we want more time to think about these because we know more and we're trying to learn more now yeah okay um <clears throat> um i don't think it's a, a bad thing um or to continue on with yes. that yeah purchase your next 2200 pounds and go beyond that because my thinking is that if, if we do decide, I'm speaking strictly for myself, but if we do decide, uh, we're, we're going to want to go beyond that date and set a date that gives the community enough time to adjust and or give the entities, you know, to make new plans if we decide to go that route as well. So I don't think continuation at this time, even with us postponing, you know, that decision is a bad call, you know at least one more pallet would give us the time for the research that we're asking for. Plus it will give us time to look into the future because I don't I, you know, mean to speak for any of you, but to say like we want to discontinue, we're not going to do it the next day. I think that it would be prudent if we said we're going to discontinue and it'll be a few months down the line, my opinion. Okay. Go, I mean, we're going into our CIP process and then of course into budgeting. So it would be nice to have some direction as we do that, but we'll yeah. still have time in December. Yeah. It's just a lot as the mayor was saying I want to comprehend. So right now, so right now you're suggesting actually just voting on option one because that's literally what we're doing. Well, even if we, if I understood what Steve said correctly, his direction already is option one. If we decide to not take any action and postpone, he's going to, to make his next purchase with or without action from us. Do I have that correct? That, that, I mean, that's correct. That's what we're doing now. If I don't receive any other direction, and that's, I guess that's the point of the options too, is that, you know, if if you voted on an option one tonight, you'll probably never see the liquid option come ahead of you again, because that would be, to me, that would be your decision to continue what we're doing. Oh, I got you. Okay. Then. So then let's just, let's just leave it set then. Is that okay? Are you yeah. postponing? Yeah. Okay, until December fifth. Yes. Or yeah. A later date. Let's let's go with December fifth. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, can we go to the second meeting in December? Because there's a lot of stuff here. Sure. And there's, and yeah. if I could, any of the dental hygienists or dental offices out there, if they could, and we have a lot of email traffic, so if you could send an email and tell me how do the dentists, people who live in the city who have fluoridated water, how do, does that differ if they come to the dentist office and they live in and they have well water? Is there a difference on how they're treated? I mean, because there are people who go to the dental office who don't have city water. Well, is there a protocol for, do they get more fluoride treatments during the year? Do they get, I know at one time they had fluoride tablets. Is that everyone's treated kind of the same? Because everybody isn't the same. You have people on well water and you have people on city water. So there is a big difference in both of those and, and fluoride occurs naturally and we all agree to that um are are people who are in well water advised to test their wells to see what what the what it what it is and then the dentist make recommendations based on that for their client see i um so so these are great questions <laughs> these are great hour and a half coffee questions um that I would suggest that you uh, ask. Um, perhaps 
Um, and one more. because there's a lot, there's a lot, there's there a lot of questions. Lot. So um, mm -hmm. rather than or direct me where to find that it's, information. Right. Where do I find that information? Because I haven't been able to. Why don't we? Why don't we do this? Um, because of those questions, if you have, I think it might. If, let me throw this out there. Um, put a put a list of the questions that you have that are related to the dental community together. Okay. Send them. Just copy. Just copy everyone because we're not debating. We're just putting together a list of questions and concerns we have. Right. So you put those together. Just copy everybody. Formulate all these questions. And then I'll present them to someone who can answer them okay. to all of us at the same time, okay. if that makes sense. Yep. And it does make sense. Because um, I had a lot of questions like that, too. And um, there's an awful lot of people that filter their water. I mean, an awful lot of people that filter their water. So how does that play, whether they're in the city or whether they're in, you know, in the township and have well water? Um, if they're filtering their water, they're not getting the fluoride. No matter what, they're not getting it. So it's hard to tell because it's a science. Science is always moving, so you have to follow the science. But there are no studies that follow these questions that are in my head that I can find. So it makes it difficult. It makes it difficult. I mean, every refrigerator comes with a filter. Who it doesn't take the fluoride out, though, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but people do have systems. Uh, yeah, yeah it's fluoride. a very expensive yeah. system yeah. that you yeah. can unfluoridate your water, mm -hmm. but it's not something your average person is going to put on their sink right. like we do, like we do in our, our refrigerators and things. Um, and these are great. These are good questions. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit and just say, why, why don't we send our why don't we send our questions to Rachel? Is that, okay. Let's send it. Okay. If you got questions like that. Um, because those are questions you need to have answered. You have to have a lot of that data and understanding. Um, same as the neurological issues on the other side um, of fluoride. So, so you know, formulate two lists if you got questions for um, for the cases and the uh, things like the lawsuit and things. Because um, that's a lot of information. I'm sure there's a lot of information in there. Um, so let, let's do that and if you want to if you want to make a motion that we postpone this topic until um what's going to be december 19th i move we postpone until december 19th mayor pro tem johnson yes council member mitchell yes council member noah yes. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, Steve. Okay. No new business. And here. All right. So I move we adjourn to closed session to discuss ending litigation for your LLC, doing business as neighborhood provisions, and number two, pending litigation for Sheboygan Cement and Glovey Incorporated versus the city of Alpena. Okay. Member Mitchell? Yes. Councilmember Nowak? Yes. Councilmember Walchak? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Mayor Proton Johnson? Yes. Thank you, folks. Yeah. At the time you need, make it if you want. It's a biggie. <laughs> it's done.
This conference will now be recorded. With no action to be taken after a closed session, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Open yet? Oh, wait. Are we open? Yep. You move. I right. move. Right. I second. Third. You don't have a second. I know I got to do it. Wait still. Mike. Peace. All those in favor of getting Anna the hell out of here? <laughs> so she can really them up.